you tonight. And Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. And so we ask you to come and impart something to each one of my friends and bless them and bless anyone who would hear this and help us to see your heart to a greater degree and to give you all the praise. Amen. Well, my, the, the title of my paper was The Consolation of Predestination. And the, uh, the write-up that we had to do earlier in the year is kind of what seemed to push me in this direction. And the more I look, the, um, the more I got blessed. And I'm sure that I will look even more after. Uh, I think that it will be part of my life. But um, I know it is. I know it was. But what I wrote in my introduction is I meet people sometimes and I get the feeling from listening to them that they feel like that their life was an accident. They, they feel like that, um, you know, they've, maybe they've heard mom and dad say that they were an unplanned event. And so I even meet believers sometimes that have this feeling and maybe there's been some of my thoughts in, in my past experience as a believer in Jesus Christ. And I'm here to emphatically declare that, that God does not have any accidents and that no person is an accident. And the Bible tells us very clearly that we were chosen in him. I was glad that Kelly mentioned that, but we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And that really blows our mind. When we look at Psalm 139, David writes, and we were talking about David, that all of our days were recorded in his book before creation in that every moment of those days was laid out before time began. So that doesn't sound like any accident to me. And so with that thought, and then we were talking and thinking about God's love, this didn't originate, but I, I heard, I can't articulate it verbatim, but I heard a lady named Fuchsia Pickett years ago. She wrote a book called God's Dream, and it really captivated me in hearing her. She articulated so well, but she said the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit swore among themselves because they had a need, because she said that love has a need, and God wanted a people in whom he could pour himself and share his love. And that just really touched my heart. And so um, that's who God is. And it says in Ephesians that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world and predestined to the adoption of children. And I've always liked that word adoption because it talks about being placed as a son, not really the adoption, if you look at it, like what we think of, but God has chosen us to be just like Jesus and chosen us and wired us to know him before the foundation of the world. And that was really, with that thought in mind and looking at the term uh, predestination, it just really seemed to me the New Testament term, or that's where we find it, um, can be couched inside this picture, at least what for me would be Genesis 22 when we look at Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. And what's touched me about that story is here is Abraham and he's asked to climb this mountain that he's never climbed before. And he's asked to take his son and to offer him up as a sacrifice just blows my mind. They'd spent their whole lives waiting for Isaac. And now God gives him this love test and says, I want to know if you love me more than you love my promises. And so he climbs this hill of obedience and he gets there with Isaac. And we are familiar with the story. And then God stops him as he's about to drop the knife and, and speaks to him and says, now I know that you fear me. And what is amazing to me is at that moment in time, he sees this ram over there in the thicket. 
and he offers that ram as a sacrifice. And then it says, after that, he called that place Jehovah Jireh. And what's amazing to me, I don't know if I can pick it up later, trying to do this with using a paper, but is it also says in that verse, and it said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Now, what's amazing about this word, gyra, is it means to see beforehand. And so when we look at this, God sees everything from the foundation of the world that applies to you, and there's nothing that he saw that he didn't see too. And that is just so amazing. Everything that God saw, he saw too before the foundation of the world. And it's that story for me that really couches the term, the New Testament term, predestination. I heard someone say one time that the Old Testament is like a children's illustrated storybook and the New Testament is like the captions beneath the pictures. And I really think that the story of Abraham, we could put in that caption beneath it, this is predestination. It's a beautiful picture of predestination. And I think one of the things when I was meditating on this is I felt like God spoke to me and says, you never see anything for the first time. At best, you can only be seeing it for the second time because I saw it first. And since I saw it, I'm going to see to it. Now, if you look up the word predestination in Strong's, it means to limit in advance or predetermine. And it's translated in the King James Bible, either determine before, ordain, or predestinate. And it's really only found in six passages in the New Testament. And all of them reveal to us that God has a determined purpose beforehand. And, I mean, one of the verses, you know, I love it. When, when Peter and John were standing before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, and he, he tells them that they crucified Christ, but they were really there to do whatever God's hand and counsel determined before to be done. That kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? And Ephesians 1.11 says, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. And so everything reveals that God doesn't do anything haphazard. Everything is according to a plan. And what's amazing, when we were studying some of these theologians, I came across one who said this about predestination. It would be a confusing world if every act and happening surprised God and required him to improvise to rescue his program from disaster. Isn't it wonderful to know that he doesn't need a plan B? because plan A is just perfect. And that just blows this up, doesn't it? But it's true. So when we look at the Word of God, I think one of the conclusions we can draw, we'll look at a few illustrations, but I don't care whether it's a devil, a demon, an unredeemed man, or even a carnal Christian, they really don't have the power to mess with God's plan. So. And when we, we had to look at R.T. Kendall, he said predestination and a con eternal security fit together. And I do believe that. Now, I think it's good to preface in here that God is not the author of evil, and I don't believe that everything that happens in the world is the will of God. 
I think that's a mystery, but we look at Psalm 115, 16, and it says the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth is given to the children of men. So I'm not going to sit here and say that everything that happens in the world is the will of God. But I do believe that we can preface Romans 8, 28, that says, even the evilness of men, God can still use it for good. So I believe that. I mean, I look at Joshua and Caleb, and here they are. They're the two of the 12 that did the right thing. Both of them had a prophetic word that regardless of what happened to the 12 in that generation, so God extended their life, and they still received the promise, even though the other, the other uh, 10 just delayed it. So he gave them long life. So, um, but they wholly followed the Lord. So the plan just seemed to get delayed. But his prevision is tied to his provision. So maybe some of us are just going to be long livers. So some of the other folks that didn't want to enter in will die out and we'll make it. Or maybe sometimes God just, I think with me, he just factored in my stupidity and it just takes me a while to get it, but I'm going to get there. So. <laughs> but God is good. Now, I will say when we look through this paper and study this, John Calvin, basically, if you summarize his reading on predestination, he put forth this concept, New Testament concept, that some people were ordained and appointed to hell and others were appointed to salvation. And I will have to say that I do not believe that. I believe if we look at Matthew 25, when in, in Jesus says, depart you cursed into everlasting fire, it says prepared for the devil and his angels. There's nothing in the word of God that says that God created hell for man. Some people may choose and reject him and go there, but that was never God's plan. We know when we share with people that, you know, about salvation, we know it says in 2 Peter that God is long-suffering and patient, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So I don't believe that predestination excludes anyone. Um, I mean, our omniscient father knows the choices that everyone will make, but I don't believe he fixes anyone's choice. And I do believe in the case of his foreknowledge of their decision that it's the one place where he hopes he's wrong. God doesn't want anyone to reject his love. Thank God. And we know that people seek to override God's plan, you remember? But what did he say about Pharaoh? He says, for this cause, I've raised you up so I can show my power and my name might be declared in the earth. One of the scriptures that gives me comfort that arrested me a few years ago was Psalm 76, 10. It says, the wrath of man shall praise you and the remainder of wrath you shall restrain. And then, of course, we like Psalm 2, where it says, when all people jump up and down and make their audacious plans, the Bible says God sits in the heavens and laughs. I mean, God never says, well, I didn't see that coming, or, you know, it doesn't take him by surprise. He just sits there and laughs. He's not intimidated. So it's really funny. God uses his enemies for his glory and the benefit of his people. And then I put in my paper some examples in the Bible. One of them was, I love the story of Moses. I mean, Pharaoh comes along and decrees that all the baby boys will be killed. I love the story of, of the uh, Hebrew lady midwives and their answer to Pharaoh. And that's comical in and of itself, if you ever want to read it in Exodus chapter 2, where they said, well, the Hebrew women just deliver their babies so fast, there's nothing we can do. So when he bought the story, I mean, that's an even greater miracle, maybe. But anyhow, you look at that, his, his mom commits him to the river, and what amazes me is his sister Miriam had the audacity when this arrives in Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter's swimming area, which had to be, again, a predestined plan of God that that would happen, then that a young girl would have the audacity to, to ask the daughter of the king of the known world, do you want me to provide a nurse for that baby? And then here we find Moses' own mother getting paid money out of Pharaoh's coffers to nurse her own son. 
And then Pharaoh is now his grandfather. So he's getting rocked on the knee of Pharaoh and he's destined to bring the dynasty of Pharaoh to its knees. I mean, our God has a sense of humor. He has a sense of humor. And then Pharaoh pays for him to get educated in the greatest universities of the greatest nation on the face of the earth is of that time. Because we know the Bible tells us that Moses was a prince of Egypt and he was, you know, he was a well-spoken man, educated man, and so forth. Of course, we also know the story when he's 40 years of age, the Spirit of God stirs him and, and he says, well, you know, God speaks to him and says, you've been called to deliver my people. And so what does he do in his zeal? He ups and slays, some, slays somebody and Pharaoh hears about it. And the one that he's rocked, he's now ready to cut his throat. And so um, Moses leaves town. Forty years later, we know the story on the backside of the desert at the burning bush. God appears to him. And what, what do we find about it? It just reminds me of Romans eleven twenty nine: 29. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And so, Moses, I've called you to deliver Israel. And it's not going to be by might. It's not going to be by power but it's going to be by my spirit, says the Lord. But thankfully, the passage of time and our past mistakes doesn't change who God has called us to be. That's predestination. So God told Abraham years earlier that in 400 years from now, your people are going to come out and they're going to get back pay. God laughs. He raises up Moses, and here we go. So I love the story. Then we have the story of Esther. And it just reminds me again of predestination. An ordinary young woman, and she gets arrested in some national, just all kinds of words we could think about of this beauty pageant, and none of them would probably in our minds be described as anything remotely godly. And somewhere in there, we're only imagining, and so I'm just adding this in, obviously, but I believe in her state, all she could think about was how to escape, commit suicide, I'm going to break out, whatever. And in the midst of her unholy imagination, God shows up and does something in the spirit of Esther that gives her the courage to walk down this road, just like he'd given Abraham the courage to walk up the hill of Mount Moriah. God visited her. And she came to realize that he had a wonderful plan, that this was not, that God's plan for her life was not going to be overthrown. And how she walked down that, when we get to heaven, we'll interview her and ask her. Only God knows. But something transpired, and her fears were replaced with hope. And she was able to shine with the beauty of the Lord instead of frowning in despair. Something happened in the heart of that woman. And what's amazing in the whole narrative, you talk about predestination and God navigating you through a minefield that only he could. I mean, you got Haman, and he was just, you know, demon-possessed. You know, he was the son of a murderer. You got a Hazareus. I mean, we'll look at the story. He was just a normal heathen king, and he wanted a beautiful wife, and we'll leave it at that. But I don't believe that, Ahasuerus had any aspirations to do anything for God, and we certainly know that uh, Haman did not. But yet in the midst of that whole situation, Mordecai reminds Esther, you've been chosen to bring salvation to the people of God. And she seeks the Lord fervently, and her favor with the king of kings gives her the courage to walk down that hall. And without the favor of God, she knew in that, that culture she would face certain death. But there was an assurance in her heart that you have been chosen for such a time as this, just like each of you have been chosen for such a time as this. It reminds me of something that John Newton said. He said, you are coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. And so we know the story. The enemy seemed to be rising to great heights, but 
You know, God visits the king in the dark night. We thought he'd forgotten all about Mordecai. And the next thing we know, Haman is hung. Mordecai is raised up. Esther's vindicated and the people of God are saved. Wow. Nobody could have planned that but God. Nobody could have planned that but God. And then, I mean, we love the story. We look at, we, we look at the, 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 the New Testament story of, or Old Testament story, rather. In Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, we look at these metaphors and verses about, you know, an angel named Lucifer that's now Satan. And instead of having a God, he wanted to be a God. Easy trap to fall in. Jesus says he fell like lightning. Lightning. We find him in Genesis in the form of the serpent, and he's planning everything in his power to make Adam and Eve fall. And we read Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, and we look at this story. And then we read in the Bible, and it says Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I mean, he didn't upstage God. He just fell right into God's plan. It's like God leaks just enough information to the devil, and the devil thinks, man, I've got the prophetic anointing now, and I'm going to preempt God's plan. And God lets him go down that road, and he just uses him. He just uses him over and over again. And so all that, all that Judas and Annas and Caiaphas did was crucify Christ and redeem the world. I mean, it says in the New Testament, if they'd known what they were doing, they wouldn't have done it but God makes a fool out of them every time. It's just so amazing. Predestination's fun. And, and then we've got this, this, I tell you what really blows my mind. We read about Issachar, you know, and, and I think it's 2 Chronicles 12, and this having this anointing to know the times and the seasons. And then we see that Israel seems to be in the decline, the northern kingdom, and there's this unnamed woman of Shunem in the, in the Old Testament that I think, again, pictures predestination. You know, she, she comes to know God, and she recognizes the anointing on Elisha. She builds this, this apartment on her home for this man of God. And the next thing we know, you know, well, what can I do for you? And, and, and his servant says, well, she doesn't have any children. So she says no, but she gets pregnant. We know that the, the promise dies on her, and so she, uh, she takes it to the prophet, and, and her son is raised up. And what's interesting in this whole story is we know the story of Gehazi, and, and he begins to make his living by telling the stories of what God did because he had a fallen out, you know. But amazingly, here he is, and then there's a famine in the line. By now, maybe Elisha's been dead. Seven years, she's out of the land of Israel, and you'll have to read it sometimes, but this is what it says in 2 Kings 8, 4 to 6. The king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, tell me, I pray you, all the great things Elisha has done. And it came to pass, as he was telling the king how he restored a dead body to life, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and her land. She walks into the palace. She has been out of the land of Israel for seven years, and God speaks to her heart to go back and petition the king for her estate and restoration. And she walks in, and Gehazi says, that's the woman. Predestination. Everything, and the king says, restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day she left the land even till now. I said, Lord, you raised up that woman, and I believe her life is, is the heritage of that Issachar anointing that's telling us, hey, God says, I got this. I got this, you know? And so, I mean, it just blows your mind. It blows your mind. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe Isaiah remembered her story when he wrote this verse in Isaiah 50, verse 10, and this is what it says. Who among you fears the Lord that obeys the voice of his servant that walks in darkness and has no light? Man, not too many people would raise their hand with that kind of, well, that's me. And listen to the answer to the Lord. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. That's an amazing verse. Makes me think, maybe he heard about that woman of Shunem. I don't know. 
And then the story of Jonah and the fish and all that, if that's not a story of predestination, I don't know what one is. I mean, you read the whole story. I mean, he had enough money to go to Tarshish. I know I'm in the will of God now. I got the cash. I'm going that way. When God had called him to go this way. And so he gets on the ship, and y'all know the story. And I, I would have, I mean, uh, Graham Cook says our best moves are on DVD in heaven. I think this would be an awesome video to see. because. Um, Everybody, he's, he's asleep in the ship wanting to die. You know, sometimes we get so screwed up in our thinking that we think, well, Lord, I just want to check out of here. That's the easy answer, right? But God gives him a second chance. The crew says, we do not want to throw you overboard, but the storm only got rougher, so they threw him over anyway. And it says, God prepared a fish. So God is so gracious that he gives Jonah another chance to fulfill God's will. Now, I'm not saying that God's going to always give us another chance, but I'll be, I think if we're honest, he gives us more than just a second chance sometimes. I think he makes it difficult for us to miss it. But I think that's a, you know, beautiful story of predestination. And I think when we look at Jonah and Moses and Esther, I think like them, we were born into this earth according to the determined counsel and foreknowledge of our sovereign Papa. I mean, it says in 2 Timothy 1.9, he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. I'm really glad about that part. So if it was according to our works, we just might not make it. But according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. That's amazing. And I think when we're talking to people, we need to tell them, hey, you are important. You are, a, an, a, you are an original. You are not a copy. And then it says in Acts 17, 26, that he's made from one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and determine the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Can you believe that God looked down through the quarters of time and said, hey, Carl and Toby and Peggy, and Kelly and Nancy, I may have missed somebody. All of you all are going to be born in this generation. I've determined that you're going to meet, and I even know how far you're going to travel, and I've appointed every bit of that before the foundation of the world. And we didn't even have to be noble to have a noble calling. It's because of our noble daddy. I love grace, don't you? I'm not saying it's an excuse, but anyway, it's amazing. So let me get down to, um, I mean, we think about 2 Corinthians where it says, 2 Corinthians says that there's works that God ordained for you to do before the foundation, good works that you're supposed to walk in. That's another predestination scripture. So let me get down to my conclusion in my paper. So. Kind of like, um, you know, I believe that predestination is never meant to be a barrier to anyone's faith. I don't buy into that. And I don't believe that it's a barrier to free will. It's a barrier to responsibility. But I believe it's supposed to be an encouragement to each one of us and a hope that when we find those challenging circumstances, like Moses I'm sorry, well, like Moses too, but like Abraham, if we're willing to walk down the path of the obedience, we're going to find the ram in the thicket. Like Esther, and that ram is not necessary. When he says, he's in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. I believe for everyone, the mount of the Lord is a different place at a different time in different seasons. But wherever that mount of the Lord is, it's going to be seen. But I don't like the word, it shall be seen. I believe he shall be seen. Because I believe if we have him, we have the provision. We don't want him to have the provision and not have him. So I think that's the story of predestination. I don't know how long I've been, but God bless you.